Where's the skateboard at? I don't know. There's Sean? Like, yeah, your cool. friend you came with. The friend you came with. He's a you, fucking bitch. You are. Your boy is going to get fucked up. He's going to get his ass kicked. He's going to get fucked, fucked up. Yeah, did he jet? I guess, dude. But you tell him he should have never talked shit because we don't be talking shit about nobody. Ah, right, that's cool. You respect us, we respect you. You know what I'm saying? That's cool. Tell your boy, man. Hi, welcome back to Epically Latered. Um, this week's episode is about the menace team. And, you know, it's not about any specific person, it's just sort of about a cultural shift in skateboarding. What the fuck you gotta say, nigga? You know, LA, New York, all these like city kid skaters that kind of came together as the team menace. It was kind of thuggy, it was kind of dangerous. When I was a kid and somebody had like the NWA tape and it was like really bad to have, it was like, Menace was like skating's version of that. Like skating's like NWA. You know, some of these skaters like Fabian and Stephen Callis, they ended up doing a lot of time in jail. Joey's, you know, he's found religion, he has a family, he's doing really well. We caught up with Eric Pupecki in Rhode Island. Javier Nunez is doing great, he's an actor. So these aren't perfect, these shows aren't perfect. Maybe four or five times I made a plan with Green and then it, it fell through. I'm not talking shit on the guy, I'm just saying. He's hard to get a hold of. Basically, I'm saying we don't have the Cream Campbell interview. <laughs> That's how it is. For a long time, I've kind of had this on the back burner as like an episode I wanted to do. Like, I should do a Menace episode. So I'm, I'm glad this is finally coming out. I hope you enjoy it. We had no Kareem for, I don't know, forever. He'll probably deny this, but you know, I claim I taught him 360 flips. You know, this is like when he was on like World SMA and I was trying to get on Grind King. That's like, you know, like 89 or something, you know. So tell me about um, exactly how you got on Menace. Kareem was a hot boy at the time, you know, winning all these, all these contests, skating for World after uh, the whole basically girl chocolate team now, or then, I guess now it's different too. <laughs> All quit and started girl skateboards. And Kareem ha had an opportunity to start his own company. And since we had all been friends for a while, I don't know. I guess he 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 saw something in us. That's corny. <laughs> Kareem came back, got on World. We were all psyched, and he was on World for like a couple of years before he came up with the idea for Menace and just put together a team of dudes that hung out in LA. They always hung out at that extra large shop. So he put together that team and said, uh, hey, wouldn't you mind filming these guys? I was like, hell yeah, down to film these dudes. I think this is the first transfer tape for Menace. Cause that was their first logo right there. What were the plans with all the footage? Well, of course we were gonna try to make a video. What were the challenges of that? That Kareem needed to approve it. You know, it's his company and his first video, and I'm pretty sure, I mean, I feel him on that. He wanted to make sure it was top notch. He didn't think it was good enough? I can't put words in his mouth, you know? All I know is that he just, he just kind of put a stop on it. Ah! Filming for Menace was one of those deals where it was at the moment. If you were there at a spot and I had the camera and everyone else was kind of along with it, then it would happen. And if it didn't for whatever reason, like we'd get kicked out of a spot or he'd break his board, then that day was over and that would never happen again. Were you ever worried about going to some of the sketchy neighborhoods and stuff like that? Because I always heard like Lockwood, people get their cameras stolen. Yeah, I mean, I found out about all that after I had been filming it for like a year or two. One day we were there filming, it was like a 4th of July, and I just remember hearing the shots, but I, I was filming lines running around the uh, schoolyard. Originally, um, not that many people skated here? No, there was only a few gang members right here from La Mirada neighborhood. And then when we started skating here, they would kind of give us a little bit of static. <laughs> I got uncles from that same neighborhood and turns out that my uncle snatched him up and told him that's my nephew and his friends. Those dudes are cool to skate here whenever they want. And you know, back then, I wasn't even trying to look for no beef. We were just trying to skate, trying to get away from the beef, you know? 
these kids were like the outcasts of skateboarding, you know what I mean? Like, they didn't have like the skateboard image that people wanted. I really liked the fact that like when Menace was started, Kareem could have like, he was really good friends with everybody in skateboarding. He could have handpicked like just top skaters, but he came for Billy, Joey, Eric Papecki, and Fabian. It was the real thing. It was just like, no man, I would like, you know, you guys are a little crew and I want it. It was like kind of the same thing as uh, the deluxe deal. They don't know what to do with me. That's what, that's what Menace is all about, a team of Guys that no one knows what the fuck to do with. All right, I'll take you, you, and you. Boom, as in now we got a team of misfits or whatever. It's all you motherfucking corns. Yeah. Like I said, no contracts, not even like, hey, Eric, would you like to be on uh, Menace Skateboards? And I was just like, one day I'm on Menace now. Like, I'm hanging out, we're all, you know, I'm on the team. So it was just kind of nonchalant. So that's why there was like no real money either. So, you know, it's just different times. And I skated for ATM for about, I guess it was like a year, and then that turned to 60-40 and uh, kind of dissolved. And then when Joey and those guys got with Kareem, I guess Kareem was looking for an AM, and they were like, well, we were already skating with Lee on 60-40 and ATM, so let's bring him over. So I got out of prison, right? And, uh, and I'm hanging out with uh, Maurice Key. He was going on tour, a World of Menace tour. So I said, damn, I'm just gonna go see my boys. So I'm on parole and I'm like, damn, I'm not supposed to leave, but I know I could leave. I know I could sneak away for a weekend. I met up with uh, Kareem and all these guys. So we went skating and we did those demos. I skated in the demos and whatever. And I guess I skated good enough and they, the world went back to, you know, wherever it went to. And I was on. I was on Menace and somebody was like, hey, there's little kids on Menace too from out here. And I was like, oh yeah, who? What did you look like? Huh? He's just little with big hands and big arms. He's a little pothead. I was like, damn, this is a badass kid. Like, but it reminded me of me because I was doing that at that age, you know? Yeah, well, I'm not Little Hob no more. That, that's, everyone knows me for Little Hob. You know, it's been documented. So like I said, from 11 to 13, being in New York, like a lot of things were, were rolling for me, you know? Me and Maurice were skating that night and Kareem happened to see us do our thing. Got Maurice Key on World Industries, and he put me on Menace. Before it actually started, but it was in the process of, you know, becoming a real thing. You know, we had plans for like Ivan Perez from Brooklyn. I wanted to get Rick Ibaceta on the team. Socrates was saying that uh, Shiloh was gonna get on too, or there was talk of that or something. Yeah, that's between uh, Shiloh and Kareem. <laughs> no, I don't know. I thought, you know, I thought at first it was too like. I think that was like original plan. I don't know who changed it. You know, Kareem's the mastermind, you know, like it said, I guess the bottom, if you look at the bottom, the mastermind distribution, and he's lurking in the background. Are they much different from 101, Blind, Plan B, World? Well, yeah, image-wise, definitely, because right off the bat, it seemed like their whole thing was a thugged out image, you know? The whole menace. In the first one, it was like beating up that kid. Yeah, that wasn't a skit. You know, we were at Lockwood, and that was a friend of theirs. And for some reason, they always used to get off on hitting him really hard. So yeah, that day, it started off as something simple, and just like one of the dudes might have let a couple of those like kicks or punches go a little too far. He got a little hurt on that deal. I think maybe they thought they had to put a little more effort into it because the cameras were rolling. Nothing was scripted, it was, everything was spontaneous. Before, I, I can only probably count two or three people that ever used hip hop in a skate video. Now, looking back at those specific times, it was just us really showing the skateboard world skateboarding through our perspective. Like that, like that, yeah, yeah. Make it look like that, bitch ass niggas. And I'll be honest with you, I, I never thought that we made the impact that obviously I've come to know that we made just from the response that we've been getting from, you know, all these people that we deal with now on a different level and say, wow, I remember, you know, what an impact it had on our lives. And we'd see that video part over and over again every time we'd go out and skate. And I've said this before, I don't think it had anything to do with cutting edge skateboarding, but I think it had more to do with the way we were presenting skateboarding. You know, it wasn't like we were inventing tricks or, you know, but it was like the stuff we put out was 
It was quality and it was genuine. You know, I don't skate as much as I did before. That's, I think, you know, uh, standard, you know, you grow up, you have, you know, you have more responsibilities, you know, I have a child now, I'm married, you know, you have bills, you know, back then I didn't have bills. You know, you wake up, you, uh, you don't even have a thought, you know, basically well, I didn't, you know, it's like, boom, wake up, do whatever, go skate, go do whatever, you know what I mean? Early on, menace days, it was hanging at my pad, really, to tell you the truth. My, actually, my chick's pad, now my wife. I remember like a lot of days being at like Billy's house, like everyone would just kind of meet there at night and just hang out and smoke or like drink or whatever. And he was like the show, you know what I mean? Like any, anytime Billy was around, whether he was at our house or like, you know, if it was at a spot, it was like everyone was around, he was in, in the middle and he was just like, you know, on 10, always. And it seemed like he wasn't like a, an everyday type of skater, but when he got on his board, he'd bang out something sick. So that was, that's what was dope about him. Where are you from? Born in Chicago, but raised in Los Angeles. So I, I consider myself a Los Angelino, I guess. Do you remember the first time hearing about or seeing any pro skaters? Like one of my friend's sisters uh, was dating some like Christian rock dude, long hair, like striper, you know, bandanas around. And he skated, like, and he gave my friend um, a Ray Bones Rodriguez. Then I think first video I saw was like Future Primitive. I don't know, then you get psyched. You're like, dude, I want to be a Bones Brigade member. You know what I mean? So how did you end up becoming one? Ah, shoot, I don't know. Right place, right time, I guess. Uh, a lot of my friends already kind of skated for it. There would be crews of little skate groups, dude, and they would fucking skate from spot to spot. And like, you'd meet up sometimes and be like, oh, hey, what's up? And he was, you know, Billy, man. He was skating rad, you know? You know, he was part of Paulo's little crew of friends. Tell me about Paula Diaz. The local ripper, you know, since always. We met in high school. He came up to me and asked me if I wanted to bail from school and go, you know, hang out and just do, do stuff that we were not supposed to be doing. So did you, you skated for Powell on the, at the same time as him later? Yeah, yeah, we were on there at the same time. And you know, he kind of he kind of helped with all that too, you know. You know, he kind of pushed like for like me and Joey to get on. You know, he wanted us to tag along, we tagged along. Stacy happened to be at Los Feliz one day, and he, he kind of liked the way a few of us skated, like Joey, this kid Ruben Prieto, and me. We filmed a part after that, never got released, and uh, Paula was like filming his like first, you know, solo part. And uh, everyone knows him as Paulo Diaz. You know, back in the day, everyone called him Pablo Diaz. That's, you know, everyone's like, dude, do you hear of this guy, Pablo Diaz? Like, oh, he ollied the six, fucking lost a tooth. Dude was like an urban legend Paul in the hood, bro. Yeah. I remember, you know, and we used to call him Pablo. Yeah. We didn't know it was Paulo. Yeah. yeah. So back in the day, you know, we would just hear these like little stories about this guy named Pablo Diaz. What he did and things And you know, we'd go stuff. to a spot and be like, yeah, Paulo Diaz, man, he did this, there, that, there. Back in the 80s, little there was clicks. all kinds of crews and clicks of skateboarding clicks. And and and, he, and uh, we used to be in Mutants. And so we used to hang out with Paulo because Paulo was like the main dude in Mutants, you know? Paulo was good. Paulo was sick. Yeah. And there was another, like, a couple Korean dudes. What's his name? Chang? Sang? Sang. Sang. And, like, there was, you know, they used to all hang out right here at this school and another school called Dayton Heights. It's yeah. right down the street. And Paulo's from here? Paulo, yeah. Paulo's right a native. Street, yeah. pa Paulo's a native of all this right here, just like us. Yeah. Paulo and Billy Valdez. Just I, I ain't gonna lie, man. We, we used to always, like, trip out on him because he would be on the Jimi Hendrix. He'd be on, like, Told the opposite side of the spectrum, man. You know, yeah. we were always like into the hip hop, rap music. Did you get dressed like skater back then? Nah, no. we used to wear dickies. It was, was that crazy. it? Was that an influence from skating, or that was from? No, that was that was just bad gang influence, man. It wasn't that we were trying to bang or nothing. It was something normal. Hey, I used to come the way I'm from, yeah. like the way I look from New York. Stevie, and his sister Stevie used to clown used to, on me. Hey, and Stevie, meanwhile, I'm clowning on her the way Stevie she looks. used to make fun of us. Yeah, like, yo, why you wear that? You know, because yeah. he didn't understand. Didn't and we used know. to make fun of him yeah. because he came over here with all this shiny, like, dressed like Slick Rick. And we're like, what, what's wrong with this dude, man? Really? Big chain gold teeth. Yeah. So we had, like, baggy clothes and white t-shirts. But it was cool because when he came, then we, you know, we got it. Got, we were exposed to his culture, where he came from, what he grew up seeing, and vice versa. Vice and that versa. was cool. And then we yeah. connected. Were you guys trying to do something different, like menace? We were just being us. Yeah, man. We were just being us. I, I mean, we were just trying to.
tell you the truth, I wanted to just fit in and skateboarding, but I didn't want to like, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know how it was going to be. I just knew it was a dope company because it was coming out of world and Kareem had already a big name. But I think that uh, we were just being us, man. That's the bomb, kid. So where we at? Where we at? Midtown. NYC Midtown, boys. I loved everything about Menace. Everything about it. The graphics, the team, the swag, homies. You know, it was it was a good thing. And from from day, uh, actually from day one too, I'm gonna say that the name Menace I wasn't psyched on, but it grew on me. You know what I mean? It was like. Cause I thought it was like, what, like fucking menace to society? Like, you know what I mean? I just thought like, I was thinking of the movie, but then it grew on me, you know? I think the name's fucking dumb. I don't know, he knew that we were actually, at the time, I think we were skating a little bit different and just representing ourselves a little bit different than most kids. For all y'all half-ass niggas with your half-ass shit, eat a dick. I, I worked for Extra Large back in those days, like at the shop. Yeah. And so we had a, we had a good connection like with, uh, with music and shit like you know, like or rap, you know what yeah, I mean? Like because yeah. Beastie Boys were involved, so like, I mean like before Cypress Hill came out, like we all fucking had like you know I had like Cypress Hill's tape, T-shirt, blah yada yada yada. Oh, oh shit, Wu Tang stickers. <laughs> we were all listening to Wu Tang too at the time. I had a lot of influence in the original first like set of series, I should say. Like, you know I mean we all sat down together, you know what I mean? But like, you know I have like a sketch where like the enter the enter the Wu Tang board. I, you know, I had, I had sketched that down thinking, oh yeah, this should be like, just like a team board, boom. You know what I mean? But Shiloh came up with the title, because at first I was like, I left that blank, because I was like, enter what? What was the ad, enter the Putang, there was like a photo? It was Kareem's idea, like, dude, let's shoot, let's shoot a, a, like a Wu-Tang uh, style ad. And that's kind of what we were doing at the time, so we were like, let's do something like fully represents us, like boom. Caustic shows up with this model, and so our first thing is like, one, is she gonna get naked? You know what I mean? Like, and then like, she's like, yeah, I'll do it. And so, you know, we all look at each other, no, you know, that's right, you know, she's gonna get naked. And next thing you know, Cossack, you know, pulls the cock block move and like, you know, he acted like it was his girlfriend. He's like, no, 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 no. No, only topless, only topless. It was a good move, it was a good move because it had been too raunchy, I guess. It's funny, the, the image that people all over the world had of Menace is like, okay, we were like, you know, a skate company of like mostly black and Latino skaters and our image was like hip hop and all this shit, but like people like really thought we were like gangsters or some shit, you know? Like people have come up to me and said like the craziest stuff, especially in Europe, because they were just like, whoa, these dudes are just like beating people up at the skate spot, you know, getting crazy. There was probably like two or three occasions where I went and I end up getting into a fight with somebody out in Europe. Like we're all in a bar in like Europe and um, there was like a wedding reception going on and somehow there was like this bouquet of flowers like that like you know it was just sitting there and I remember like I picked it up and I grabbed it and like I threw it into a group of skaters and they all like jumped and kind of like shredded it apart but it was actually from the real wedding or whatever and this gnarly like European dude like came up and like wanted to fuck me up and they're like hey dude you should probably go up to your room like this dude's like pretty pissed. And uh, I went up to the room, it was me, Fabian, and the girl Fabian was messing with. And this girl had like 666, like tattooed right above her like vagina. C pretty crazy girl. And um, I opened up the door and it was a dude and he like clocked me right in the face. And Fabian en ended up beating his ass. So he beat up the father of the bride in our hotel room. <laughs> I don't know, I can't get into that. But I know he liked to get us in trouble. <laughs> but he was crazy too, you know, but I guess I was too, so we, it was no big deal. <laughs> it's all a good time. You know, everyone would come around and want to talk and hang out. You know, all the hip hop kids and hip hop skater guys, like, oh, they'd, it would be like uniforms. They'd walk up in a menace uniform. It was ridiculous. And that was a big, we went to Germany one time, the whole stadium was menace uniforms. It was like Joey's and, Eric's and Fav like dudes trying to look like us, it was crazy. And we weren't even doing nothing in the contest, you know what I mean? We weren't gonna win. <laughs> we got to do everything, we'd go to like great hotels, we'd have a great time, we'd, we'd, we'd have stacks of it and weed, you know what I mean? And we had 
skateboards galore. We flew, all, we got to go on all the A plus tours. So we'd go to Germany, we'd go to Switzerland, Italy, everywhere. And that, you know, I can't beat that. I remember, you know, I, they used to tell me, yeah, well, you know, you're not going to make it in skateboarding. And I'd be like, really? Okay, we'll see about that. We'd go on tour and the overwhelming presence of Mena's product that was out there, like denim and, you know, jackets and boards and all these different things. I remember it, it was out there. And if I had to gauge based on what I saw, it was definitely successful financially. Looking back on it, like you, you never think like, this is gonna end one day. You know, you're like, I skate for minutes, we're the shit. We don't even need to skate. We got the best image, you know, like Kareem is the man. And he's like, he's basically telling me like, we're gonna be chilling for life. And you believe that shit, yo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, you're my idol, I'm, I, 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 I'm hanging out with you, you're telling me that we're straight, we're good, I see the way you're living, you got a pocket full of money every day, and I'm like, you know, I believe that shit. Fishy from day one. <laughs> Biggest check you ever get on like your board releases, boom, bam, big check, wow, dude, I made this much, like, bam. Then it, then it goes like, whoa. Then, you know, then it stays at a steady, like, you know, it's like, you know, checks just got started getting smaller. You know, it was like, hint, hint. You know what I mean? Like, and not that boards weren't selling, it's just like, you know, fucking cutting the checks. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know where the other money went, but who knows? When did we get these? So this was after Menace, obviously, MNC. So this must have been the, when we were starting MNC, when we had to change the name the first time, I guess. I mean, oh, that was a huge blow, bro. Oh. I'll be honest with you. That, that was that was a MNC. huge blow. We'd be on tour, and the kids would still be referring to Menace. Oh, but right. we'd be wearing an All City shirt, and they'd be like, oh, what's All City? Menace, cool. You know, the trademark lawyers fought it out, and they said that MNC was still not, you know, enough of a change, and that's when we had to do the All City thing. And then, as soon as we maybe thought we were getting a little bit of momentum, it came again, and I guess All City was owned by Russell Simmons, Fat and, farm, man. and you know it was just a big old thing. And then finally, man, when Kareem City locked down Star. City Stars, and so it had four names, three. Oh. Well, there's Menace, well the MNC, MNC. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you could say four. All City, yeah. City Stars. Yeah. That's just basic business. If you try to push a universal product and you change the name every three months, like people aren't gonna like the people aren't that smart. They, you got to drill it into their heads and then. You think girl would be as good as if they had to change their name three times? You know, maybe, but that stung us, man. I, that definitely probably put a big hiccup in the business. If it stayed menace, I think that, that marketing would have been just through the roof. You wouldn't have been able to stop it. We need an intro. Uh, intro? All right. Um, it's Javier Nunez, AKA Hans. And we're gonna go inside the store and talk about Menace. Good old Menace days that a lot of people have yet to hear. All right. Come on, guys. Let's talk. Where are you from? Bayonne, New Jersey. How far is that? It's about. Well, when you take the bus and train, it took me about an hour. Every day after school, I'll be in sixth grade, seventh grade, just after school, I'll go to New York by myself. I'll just be out. I'm like, I'm, I'm not chilling in Jersey. I'll go to New York and meet my other friends, skating in the skate side. My name is Javier Nunez. I've been skating for a year and a half. I'm age 11. Like, the most place I like to skate is the banks. The Wheels of Fortune was just, uh, I, was, I was skating the banks and Pepe Martinez was up there with his filmer from DC. I believe his name was Dave Schubert. And fucking, he just saw me skating the banks, pretty much all those tricks that he filmed me do, I already did. And he was like, dude, let's film that again and get you a little thing on this 401 magazine, let's interview you. I'm like, all right, cool. And then uh, that was all filmed in like 15, 20 minutes. The whole part? The whole part, yeah, it was, it was quick. It wasn't that long. 
411 days, he was the fucking little Spanish dude skating at the banks. And I was the black kid from Philly. And he skated for Dead End, and I skated for Element. He would come down to Philly, stay at my house, hang with the homies, skate. And <laughs> you know, my mom. And we got so many crazy little kid stories in my house that, you know, me and him will forever, forever, forever be friends. I know you obviously saw this book already. Stoops. Pretty much what we're talking about, that whole era. See, that's actually me right here when I was on Dead End before Zoo York. That's my hat. And then we have me skating through Manhattan. This whole book, Ori Macopolis shot. He told me to this day, like, Hob, I remember you being young and cursing me out, telling your friends, like, why is this old man following us shooting photos? Obviously, you know, I got mad love for Ari now. But uh, yeah, he tells me that every time. Like, he just cursed me out when you were like 12 years old. And I told him, I'm sorry, Ari. But that was when I was young, I didn't know no better. That's the whole crew, that's pretty much the crew we were skating with. You can see in this photo, Harold Hunter just being himself, snapping on somebody. And then look, he got all of us just laughing. I was around all these guys going to clubs in New York, being exposed to so much shit that these kids in my fifth grade class had no clue. Like, I couldn't have conversations with them just because they weren't on my level. Who's your skate crew? We were like, considered the young dudes because, you know, everyone was older. So it was me, Maurice Key, Joey Alvarez, all the usual suspects from, you know, late 90s, mid 90s that were skating at the time. Was that around the time you were in kids? Yeah, like pretty much all this shit happened in the span of like two years, man. Once I got my foot in New York, I started meeting all these people. They, they took me under their wing. Harold was the one that got me in kids. My name is Harold Hunter and I skate for American Dream, which is totally cool. We were just skating through the city, just posting up at Asta, and then Harmony Korean comes walking by. Harold saw Harmony and was like, Harmony, you gotta put Hav in. You gotta write him in the movie. Like Harold was serious to Harmony, and Harmony was like, yeah, you know what? I actually, I actually got, I got a role for you in the, in the movie. So I was like, cool, you know, I didn't think nothing of it. Oh, was it real alcohol, real weed? Uh, yeah, it was real weed. But I already was smoking before we, we were doing the film, so I was already exposed to all that. And then uh, he just made us feel comfortable by letting us really smoke weed. No biggie. I just thought how I was just bigger than life. I'm like, damn, he shot past me like crazy, you know what I mean? And he was the model, he was doing TV shows and movies and kids. And when he got on Menace, I was like, damn, you know what I mean? He on one of the best teams in the world. He had the sponsors, so when he came out to San Francisco and I was ripping around in the streets, he would be right with me. Because he already had the sponsors, so he could go and shoot photos with all of them and then come back and hang with me. I just really thought Hob was was the truth, yo, as a young young kid. What tricks did you have in trilogy? The switch flip over the wall, a couple Cali tricks. Oh. Something on the bangs. I didn't really have a full part in the trilogy. Like I said, man, I, I should have been more on my skating as well. You know, I have myself to blame. I don't blame no one else, you know. I was a little knucklehead back then and you know, to be honest, I didn't listen to Reem half the time. I didn't really skate much. Like I said, me being around a whole different world of people, all my friends didn't skate every day. This nigga's all, this nigga ill upside down. <laughs> Are you <okay? laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like out here where people skate every day and have friends that are willing to film, have a clique of friends that's willing to film. It wasn't. Like, that's what made me move to Cali. To be honest, if it wasn't for Kareem, I wouldn't be involved that much in skating because he's the one that took me out of New York and New Jersey to expose me to the whole skate world industry. You know, I'll never forget that. You were on when it was like Fabian and all these people to when it was like Spanky and all those people. Yeah, pretty much when it came to our city, I was the older one. It wasn't Little Howl no more. It was Little P-Rod, Little Devin, Little Mikey. And none of the people that were on, that were older than you, were on anymore? Nah, except for Lee. It was, it was just only me and Lee left. You had a board on City Stars? 
Nah, unfortunately, nah, I never had a board on City Store. My first pro board was was shut. Did he ever express to you like, fuck, why aren't they turning me pro? I can't even go there. Okay. I can't, because it's going, it's, it hurts. It hurts me to know that it just hurt, yo. Yeah, of course Javier would get salty that Kareem turned Paul and them dudes pro and all of that. And I was there with him every fucking day. Me and Reem had a fallout because of Hav. You know what I mean? And I respected Kareem so much that I didn't want to disrespect Kareem. But Javier was my blood. You know, I knew him before he even met Kareem. By the time it was for him to shine and get that value from Menace, it was already City Stars and, and Kareem already had all of these dudes. So when Hav wanted that light, I don't think I don't think the light was shining on that team anymore. So yeah. it, it's hard, yo. You gotta do it when it's supposed to be done. Were you bummed at all when like P Rod turned pro? Yeah, you know, I wasn't bummed at P Rod. You know, he deserved it obviously. But I was like, you know what? Yeah, I was I was kinda bummed out on Reem. I was like, you know, it's it's kinda lame. I've been with this team forever and these dudes are getting boards before me. But I guess he felt like, you know, these dudes are killing it and all this shit, which Ah, uh, whatever, man. Hobbs <laughs> hard-headed. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. That's my man, and I love him. But Hobbs going to do what he want to do, and that's just Javier. Everybody's different. Hobbs had the chance to be where I'm at, and when he was given a decision, he didn't take it, yo. When he got the opportunity, he didn't take it, yo. You know, and he still has the skills, and it's harder to get on companies when you're older. So you might want to take advantage of those things in your early 20s. My mind, I wasn't always 100% focused with skateboarding, which I wish I was, you know. But I'm trying to get back into the swing of things and, and just skate a lot, you know. I took, I took a lot of things for granted when I was younger. And, you know, as I get older, you start realizing the shit, you learn from your experiences, so. And you had the HBO show. Yeah, and then and then and now uh, the producer from Entourage, Rob Weiss, happened to come by the shop, and was like, "You know what, dude? You you're perfect for this character I have. You 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 fit perfect, man. It's about this crazy skateboarder, bipolar dude from New York. But I don't let these dudes blow air on my ass. I'm like, ah, right, it is what it is. Before you know, a couple months down the line, it gets picked up for uh, first season. I'm gonna make you real proud the event today. Watch." Feeling real good. Just don't set no kids on fire. The season was over, but now HBO picked up the season again to come out in the summer of 2011. So I go to New York in March to start filming. Is that LA is a lot different than New York? Oh, it is. It is. It's more relaxing for me. You know, I did it. We did it all running around New York City when it was real grimy at the time, and it was it was real fun. You know, time for a change in my life. I did the New York thing, now I come to LA to, to get different things going on. Cool, thanks, Javier. I got a crazy story about how he would, oh, I got a fucking crazy story about how. All right, we in my crib, right? And we was playing this knockout game where you, where you stand up against the wall, then you hold your breath and they pump on your chest. How I pump my chest, I black out. I have a dream that Ryan Hickey frontside flips the bank wall. Next thing you know, I hear boom! I'm like, I wake up like, what the fuck? I'm face first on a coffee table. And my mom's like, what the fuck is going on? And, we, and I look at Javier's face and they just face is like, oh shit, like, you almost died. You know, we played a knockout game and somebody, he's supposed to catch them yeah, if they yeah. fall. He just let me fall and fucking hit my face on the coffee table. And I looked at this nigga like, yo, man, I should fuck you up right now. I'm glad I didn't die. And me and Hob always bug out on that.
Did you have the nickname Eric Poop Puppy? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's what Gino said. Oh yeah, baby. Try to forget all those things. <laughs> right, guys? Yeah, my daughter should be along soon, but that's her over there in the photo, in the yellow one. Did you grow up close to here? Um, yeah, close to here. We didn't grow up in this house, though. This was my mom's house and her, her husband. You know, these are all the, the hits. But we bring out the computer now, so there's no more... You know, I got this new night that I bring a little vinyl out, but, you know, we just go out with big boxes like this. The vinyl. I used to, anyway. How did you get into it? Just local people around here, skaters, and uh, it was just the great music, you know? These are like some of my LPs. I don't get to them as much as I used to. I do plumbing work, and that's what I get make my money with. When I used to be a pro skater, I'd sit in my room, smoke, listen to album after album, hang around. What year did you start skating? Hmm. I don't know when I was like 15, so 23 years ago. You know, I got a late start, per se, 15, 16 years old. But were you always involved in like sports? or? Yeah, I played baseball and I uh, did BMX. Yeah, the, the skateboard took the BMX bike away. Yeah, a lot of little contests in Rhode Island. Second place sponsored, 1990. Who were you sponsored by then? Ah, it was just probably a local shop, what, the watershed. And how did you end up getting up I just uh, I took the bus to Cal San Francisco. I got uh, the bus with a couple of friends, and uh, we, I just went for it. It was quick, too. It was like I was out there a month, and I was already sponsored and ready to rock. I just showed up at EMV and just skated with everyone that was there. Jim Thiebaud was the first hookup, and James Kelch. Those guys liked me, so they would just give me stuff. My first photo was on Market Street doing the, you know, the Thunder Rad, doing that ollie over that fountain there. I was going big, pretty much. He was out in San Francisco, and when I went to visit with Keenan and Huff, they were staying at Ron's house, and I think Eric was down with fun back then. I think that one trip, that's when I met Eric. He was just a good skater. Who did you become friends with that was on fun? It was uh, me, Keenan, and, and Huff. And that was the main three dudes that would roll. It would be me, Ron, Keenan, Huff, and me in the car, like going around the tour fighting, you know, like having fun, but... It was like, cause there was no money, so it was, you know, all just piled in a car, like expected to do stuff or nothing, like. But we, we were having fun, so it didn't matter. What were some of your favorite things that you got on video? The things I didn't get is some of the, the things that uh, would be my favorite, you know? It's like, that's, the kickflip the gods had to be the, one of the great, great feelings, you know? That was, at the time, too, it was, I was like, it was like two weeks after gods had done it. And the time I had, the, the broke, Broke the board sequence was before Gons had done it. So then Gons was just hanging out one day. He's like, oh, maybe I should just kick my butt. And he just goes and does it. Like, oh. And I was there. I was like, fuck. And then a couple weeks later, I was skating it with somebody, and I just did it. But it, you know, it felt really good. But I was like, fuck, I should, you know, three weeks ago, I could have been the first. But <laughs> that four one opener. Yeah, the open, the hard flip down the seven. Yeah, that felt real good too. I, I was happy with that because I was. Down and out, I didn't have a sponsor right then either. I was just filming with Aaron, doing, doing the thing. And Mike Trinansky at the time, he was trying to set me up. Like if I landed a couple good tricks, he'd throw me some money, give me the boards I need, keep me going. Because he knew I didn't have a sponsor, I was like kind of out there. Because I was talking to Mike Trinansky at the time, he was trying to set me up for Plan B and all that. But uh, Menace came along right around the same time, so I kind of went for that. I remember he came up to me in Vancouver and said, Yo, you didn't even tell me you were going to you know, jump on Menace, you know, I wish he would have told me, like, just kind of breaking me up. He was happy for me, but, you know, he was just kind of saying, you know, whatever, just give me shit. Were you filming a lot with Socrates in, like, the tournament? Oh, yeah, that was, like, it was every day. Just, like, go eat with Sock, go film with Sock, hang out with Sock, yell at Sock. It was a good time. He was great. He was the nicest person, drive you anywhere, do anything. Kopecky was always down to skate, but it seemed like he wasn't down to skate the stuff that the other dudes was... They were skating. He had a different bag of tricks, definitely. He was um, kind of an innovator, it seemed to me. I don't think he was like one of those dudes that was like busting flip and flip out type stuff. He was just the kind of dude that would go for like a back tail and a big rail or, or front crooking the Venice ledge. What about the Lockwood sessions? 
everyone's watching when you're out there. Like it's in Rhode Island, like you're on a dead street with nobody, like you're there. In Lockwood, it's like, it's a center stage. Everyone's filming, you know, people ripping. This is a time when all these tricks were being done on the big pen benches for the first time. Like, you know, even like switch nose grind on a, on a top of a picnic table, it's like no one had done it. You know, front, when I did the front side blunt, no one had done it. You know, every day it's a new trick, first time ever done. You know, it was exciting, like, you know, just go home and like talk about the stuff, it's cool. Did like the team fit with like your vibe at the time? Yeah, it was, we all, we all, you know, we all got along right away, you know, it was everyone smoking, everyone's drinking, skating, just, you know, doing that all the time, so. Yeah, I don't know, it was just a good time. We, we got to move around a lot together and uh, just be able to act as crazy as we wanted to be and like, you know, get treated with the respect everywhere we went and it was, it was good. And that, you know, I can't beat that. Were there any other like people that you guys wanted to be on the team that never got on? Nah, we had a team. It was pretty much, it was like almost like, who, who are we gonna let into this? Nobody, forget it. You know what I mean? You had to be, like even Stevie Williams was like dying to get on. We'd be sitting there drinking Hennessy in Philly. He'd be doing flat ground in front of us all night. Just like trying to show us like how high he could pop his shit. And like, you know, and look at Stevie now. He's like killing it. Yeah, I was a, I was a fan. I always been a fan of, of Kareem and Menace, and I always wanted to be on that team. That's a team that I wanted to be on, and I ne it never happened. It's like buying a car. You know what I mean? I want the Lexus, but I had to settle for the goddamn Accord. You know what I mean? Yeah. It sucked, but at least I got a chance to ride in a Lexus. You feel me? It was like one of those, I was happy just knowing them dudes, and being it felt like when I'm around them, I'm actually a part of the team but I didn't get the product of going on a tour, so. But then it got goofy, and then people like Kane Gale got on, and just, it's just like, it just kind of took the integrity, like, right out of it, I think. I wasn't down for that. And that's when I got grumpy. You know, I was, like, kind of distancing myself from everybody by being so grumpy. I mean, you stayed on until the end, right? Yeah, of course, but, like I said, all that footage was mad old, and, like, they didn't want to use my footage because it was so old. You know, I wasn't taking control, so I can't blame anybody. So I don't regret none of that. So even though, like you said, I look back and I'm like, oh, I should have done this, should have done that, but whatever, just keep going. Did your daughter ever ask about your skate career? Yeah, not too much. I don't, I don't talk about it. It's not like, I just live in the, the present a lot of the times. You know, I don't like, oh yeah. I go through phases where I'm like, I used to do this. But then, you know, get back to reality. Has she ever seen 20 shot sequence or anything? She likes it all right, but she likes iCarly, she likes, you know, victorious and shit like that, so. Oh, good fall, Dal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you get our bunny? No. Uh-oh, don't scratch it. What's your bunny's name? Cupcake. It's my favorite. This one. Was it all pretty? Yeah. And this one's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, I met Eric in Long Beach at ASR. You know, whatever, fun times lead to crazy weekend. Remember that uh, Guru was performing that weekend. I remember Eric got arrested that weekend. Oh, I forgot. You got arrested? Yeah, yeah. He got arrested and uh, Keenan oh. bailed him out. Not, Not for being for for being too silly. Uh. That's why he wasn't. Way too silly. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't being a good boy. Hey, what is that? It's a mirror that I had in prison. I had this for like the last five years I was there. You gotta kind of smuggle it wherever you go. Uh, it'd be like shaving and, you know, looking at myself in the mirror. Man, I could see who's coming or who's going. When they come and search your, your cell, they hit your cell so hard and they like to break things and take things, you know? So this mirror has made it with me to most of the time, more than half of my way in there. Skating is like Peter Smolik said, there's no coaches, you're your own boss. So there's no really no, no structure is, it, is the right word to be like, hey, you gotta get up, you gotta do this. And we kind of like, I don't know, we kind of do what we want. So you kind of gotta live and learn. You know what I'm saying?
how we even got into skating was crazy. I stole my first board. Didn't even know about skating. I seen some two Oriental kids on the block when we were on bikes, and we went and told them if we could borrow their, you know, borrow their skateboards to just because they seen them hopping on the board. I hit them up like, how much are they? How much are these boards? And they told us this price, and it was like forty nine fifty at the time. Forty nine fifty is a lot of money for my mom and dad. So where do we go? We went out towards Beverly Hills, Eagle Rock, Glendale, looking around. And I hate to say it, but we were looking around for a little white boy to rob him. I had seen him skate a few times when he would come uh, riding around with our other friend Juan. And I knew these guys were on top of their game. They were, they were the best I had seen. So I said, okay, these are the guys I need to be around. You know, I wanted to be around the best, and I knew that being around Fabian was, you know, gonna help me. Back in the day, back in like 87, 88, we used to go to this ramp on 23rd of Vermont near USC. And to get there, you gotta pass through like at least three, three or four at different least, gang neighborhoods. At least, man. So to get there and to come back home was a mission. I lived in a, a you know, gang neighborhood. And I guess a rival gang Rockwood. had, had you know, come looking to, you know, shoot up and they actually caught caught us right when Fabian was about to leave. And I was like, all right, man, I'll see you later. And, it's, and we it was looked. a burgundy, burgundy regal with, regal. A, with, a, with a sunroof. And then and as soon as I look, I was like, yo, these guys are creeping was like up this. real slow. <laughs> all of a sudden, bro, all I remember was some dude coming out of the roof. Yo, the first time I seen a real Uzi. I remember when you were in here, it was like you were in a different world. You forget that you were in the hood. You forget, I mean, there'd be, you know, I don't even know how many shootouts we've seen back back then. You think it's like a, a nicer area now? Now it's way nicer. Echo Park, all the way up to here in Silver Lake, as of 2002 or three, it really changed. It's like, you see a lot of more like uh, artsy people living in Echo Park, running around now. Back, back then, I mean, I grew up born and raised there and you would never see that. Yeah, all right here in this area, there's right here, there's there's Crazies, Echo Park, Headhunters, and Diamond. We're on Douglas Street. If you go two blocks up and to the left, that's Diamond Street. This is Headhunters. So why is that? Why not? It's just, dude, it's, it's like a group of kids that grew up on this block didn't get along with the group of kids that are on that block. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started you know what I mean back in the 80s and and um, there's always been 18th Street lurking around our whole family was raised right here we lived here my mom she was raised right here too in this house in this house yeah if, if you're talking about gang area this is headhunters is this where you started skating uh, no I was too small I didn't right here was just like me growing up like learning how to ride a bike those are bullet holes yeah Look, you can see those are bullet holes right there. If these streets could talk. They have a better story to tell you than what I could. A way better story. Like I said, a lot of my friends in skateboarding used to really like trip out on how they would see my dad or my my uncles, my sisters, everybody in my family, you know, were considered gang members. And uh, you're guilty by association regardless. A lot, of them, a lot of the times they wouldn't even want to drop me off at home. Like I said, they would two blocks away and let me walk the rest. Well, I remember meeting Fabian and the first impression was that he was a nice guy. He was like really cool. He was just down to like introduce himself and like, you know, he was just a good guy. But I knew that he was like real. Like I knew that if it came down, if, if the time came where he had to like throw down or anything like that, like I wouldn't want to fuck with him. And I knew that his family was all up in it and you know, skateboarding kept him away from that. Were you in a gang or anything like that, or just like joined what they were doing? Yeah, I did, but I, I never got too deep into it. I knew it was always there because I was born into it, man. You know, there's no like, oh, I want to go hang out with these guys. I'd go home and I'd be with them guys. You know what I mean? It's a difference when you gotta go somewhere and be with your homeboys or your 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 gang. But when you go home and you live with it, it's nothing to you. It's it's just it's just how you are, you know? Who would you say out of the Menace guys was like 
the most motivated to get tricks. Probably Joey and Fabian. Those guys were always motivated. Fabian would call me. You want to go film? Like, yeah. Were there though a lot of other crazy stories? You know, filming with Fabian and I wouldn't say just crazy. Just maybe not normal for regular skaters, but Fabian wasn't like your regular skater. <laughs> he just didn't take bullshit. Since we were kids, you know, Fabian always had a sharp fuse. Not to mention everything was put on a platter for us, you know, from women to drugs to fame. So you add that to the formula, you know, and it's, it's a recipe for destruction. Skateboarding kind of saved me from getting into trouble, but at the same time, I think I had a lot of time and money on my hands. From not having nothing to having a little something, it felt pretty good, you know, and I was, sometimes you think you're invincible. Oh man, you know what? We, I gotta take you to this house. It was a drug house. Instead of them having a, a, a big pit bull, I was their guard dog. They know that I used to skateboard and everything. They trusted me. When my money was good, they loved me. You know what I mean? When the money was good, I had all kinds of money to buy dope from them and to give them skateboards when they needed for their kids or whatever. And then when my money ran out, just guess what? They didn't like me no more. So what exactly, you were mostly just doing drugs, or were you like? I was selling and doing, mostly doing. One thing I did, and, I, and I'm thankful for, is I, I separated the gang life and my drug use and my skateboarding for a lot of reasons, mainly because I, I was embarrassed and I didn't want to show my face. And, you know, I was looked at as Fabian Alomar, pro skater. He's a good skater, a real ghetto kid, real coming up, and I didn't want to ruin that. I mean, that, that image I have was good because I kept skating and I produced and I, I did everything I was supposed to do. But I felt this weird feeling inside. Like, I, didn't, I couldn't come around. I didn't want to burn no bridges. You know, I couldn't burn my bridges with skateboarding. I wanted to keep it separate, so I stood in the hood. I stood around where the spots where no one would come. We grew up in the streets, so it was like it was tough to make a transition to, like, being a full-on skater and shit, like, you know? You skate and then you go back to the hood and then you see you dealing with all these obstacles. It's not like we're going back to the suburbs and it's all good and we can skate every day. It wasn't like that. And it caught up to them. You know, Fabian got locked up. You know, that's what Reem was like, you know what? I gotta think about, you know, making it a real, real skate company, not about an image thing. You know, there was so many things going on in my life at the time that uh, it was bound to happen. I showed up to Kareem's house to pick up my check one day, and he's telling me, you know this is probably one of your last checks right here. You know, this is, this is it. You know, I'm, I, I've cut you so low that I can't be, I'm, now I'm just gonna, you know, I don't see you doing anything, and I'm telling him, and it's true, my ankle was swollen, you know? But from skating, on dope. Once I got kicked off, things went like a whole, took a whole nother turn, I guess, you know? See that? See where that bungalow is? Yeah. That fence where the diamond is, the, the baseball diamond? There's bathrooms right there. You see there they are, the white bathrooms? Those are my offices, my oficinas. Anybody who went in there got fucked up while I was smoking crack. These dudes playing tennis, these little Filipino dudes and shit, they all go in there in the morning and like, hey, it's 7 o'clock in the morning, let's go play tennis, you know? And they, and they, they go in there and they want to play tennis and, and, and they want, hey, why is the bathroom locked and shit? Like, I could hear them talking, like, and they were trying to force it open because I locked it on purpose because I'm in there smoking dope, looking at nudie magazines and shit. And that's what I did. I do me and do me. So I'm in there fucking doing my thing. Wait, there's my church. Um, so I'm getting, I'm getting loaded in there and they're fucking up my high by trying to get into my offices, like, into those... And I'm like, man, what the fuck? So I, when they come in... All they did was get robbed. I might fuck them up and then I end up leaving. I would say a prayer before I go rob you. God, please don't, don't let me get caught. Don't let me get hurt. I'm sorry for what I'm about to do. I know it's wrong, but I, I feel like I have no choice. And so I would go and rob this person and jack them. And I let them know, hey, look, straight up, I'm on dope. I'm smoking crack. 
you better give me all your money or you're gonna get hurt. And if you don't give it up, believe me, I'm gonna cut you or I'm gonna shoot you. So you're bound to give it up. Either way, whether you wanna walk away or me drive away with you laying there. So most of the time they would cooperate. And I was robbing people right outside my door. When you're on cocaine, that, that, that stuff really plays a number on your head, you know what I mean? So I would do it at all times. In the evening, if I catch you slipping, I'll get you and rob you, whatever. You know, that was my mentality. Give me a puppy. Look at these dogs, man. They've probably been so abused that they don't yeah. trust nobody, dude. Look, there he comes. Get it. Get it. I'm not proud of it, man. I'm not. I'm not boasting about it. I'm not trying to. I'm not put, trying to put any light on it and 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 in a positive way. It's a negative thing I was doing. You know, it's bad. But you know, I just didn't. I, I didn't at that point in my life. I didn't care. You know, I didn't care about nothing. I didn't even care about myself. So why would I care about somebody else? I think with Fabian too. It's like, I think that might have been a consequence of like adjusting after skateboarding. The last time I seen Fabian, I was hungover, living in Hollywood, and he came over the next morning, and I hadn't seen him in a long time, and he, he, he wanted to sell me uh, a pit bull puppy, because he knows I'm into dogs, and, uh, or some sodas, like cases of sodas, and he was in some, with some dude in a random van. So it was a trip for me. You wanna ride down the alley where I got arrested mm -hmm. for my crime? This is where I got arrested. They cornered me in here. There was all like five cop cars here and a helicopter and they caught me right in this alley right here. They surrounded me. I was busted right here. They told me, get out the car. They were behind me, in front of me and I was just trying to make it to my, my mom lived two, two houses away from the dope spot where we were just at. And I was trying to make it to my mom's because I knew these cops were probably gonna beat my ass. That was it right there. I got locked up, I was done. That's just... I went to prison for, for eight years. I got arrested for a carjack, kidnap, robbery with a 11 inch ice pick. The ice pick had DNA, someone's DNA, and it had, and it had crack residue. Because I was using that same weapon that I used to whatever, stab, and uh, <laughs> I was using it to smoke. And that would be my, that's why I had it. It sent me to a Salinas Valley, level four. I was in the 270 yard there. And um, it's nothing but solid lifers doing, people got life, people are just straight killers and, you know, drug dealers and, you know, just no, no, nothing bad at all. You notice nobody smiles in prison, so. Yeah. You don't get those smiles. You show up the first day and you're like... You show up, you're like, you know, new fish. You're in prison. You, 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 you're sketchy on everything. At first, people don't, they don't know if you're like Dominican or like Puerto Rican or like what. And you have to go like, oh, I'm with you guys. That's a good question. If you raised here and brought up here and you, and you got the, the, the southern, like... Hispanic ways, then you you considered Southsider. You're a homie automatically, and don't try to get out of it and don't try to fight it. Because a lot of dudes try to deny it just to get away and try to hide. But if you're actually like say a Puerto Rican native and come over here and you don't know what the hell's going on, then they'll give you a pass and you could be a other. You could be a other, which is other is like um you could be Samoan. Chinese, you could be whatever, you, you know, they got like, others is anything, like, it's a mix. All, all the Southern Mexicans, we all stick together, man. I got sent to this other prison called California Men's Colony, and uh, it's no good, meaning no good as far as like, they hold uh, snitches, rapists, child molesters. All of my friends told me, hey man, you know where you're going. You're gonna have to get off there and do your thing. You got uh, 72 hours to handle your business. That means I have 72 hours to crack someone, stab them, beat them up, or whatever I'm gonna do, 
Because they're going to think because you were there. Yeah, I was mingling and chopping it up and eating and hanging out with a bunch of rapists and I didn't do nothing. Nobody likes their kids being touched by another human being, you know? Man or woman. So, all these people deserve to get cut. And I cut a couple of them. Did you stab somebody? Yeah, a child molester. I hit him with a razor. They brought me the paperwork and I seen it. I knew the next day what I had to do, which was uh, Christmas Eve. I got added more time to me. Did he survive? Yeah, he survived, unfortunately. So, he survived. But if he had died, he would have been Oh, I would, I would still be, there wouldn't be a story right now. There'd be, <laughs> it wouldn't be a, a good happy ending to this story. The people in there know that you used to be a skater? Oh, yeah. There? Yeah, I only told a few. I only told a couple. I would get pictures sent to me from the internet, pictures of me skating and stuff. And I told a couple of my cellies, and they're like, wow, that's you? I used to make inside there. I used to make a little full-on skate park. I would get sent cards or I used like old cards that my friends were, you know, were trashing. They were going to discard and get rid of stuff. So I'd, I'd set up and tape and use like um, Kool-Aid for glue. And I'd get tape, pieces of tape that come in letters. And I'd make a skate park, like a ramp to wall, a pyramid ramp. I put all, I put together like a little mini ramp. And the, board, the boards were kind of hard to make, you know, because... But uh, I used to like to pretend just with my hands, just with my two fingers, you know, just, you know. It was always when I go to sleep and lay down and, and, and knock out. I had so many crazy thoughts and different things like, man, what if I would have done this? Where would I be or if I just continued skating and not got caught up in all this drugs and all this, you know, crazy violence that I did? And I should have just stood hanging out with this person or I should have just continued to skate and not... You know, why did I, why did I, you know, all the whys and what ifs. You just got to keep going forward, dog. You can't, all the, all those questions, you, you could drive yourself mad with that, you know. The very same night I got out, I went to, I went to Skate Lab in Simi Valley. Why'd I, you go there? I went there just to go because I have, from when it, when it first opened, I had a board up there. I wanted to see if it was still there or if they kicked it out or what, you know? And it was there. I called up Jerron Wilson. And we talked. He was like, damn, good to hear from you. Well, well, yeah, I'm here. I'm here skating with Guy and Costin and, you know? And I was like, what? Let me talk to Guy. Guy was like, dude, I'm gonna go get you and pick you up, man. Where you at? So he came, he picked me up and we hung out, you know? We used to always hang out. That's my best friend right there. That's my boy, you know? Once he scooped me up and like, you know, he kind of embedded the idea of me like just skating again. And so he started taking me around with him. And yeah, if anybody got me back into it, I could say Guy did. Back into the scene, period. You know what I mean? Because I didn't think that, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't think skateboarding was going to accept me back again or be have love for me because of what I did. You know, I got this board out, Skate Mafia. I'm about to put this shit together tomorrow. You gotta take advantage of, of the, the things that skateboarding gives you. If, if you're getting paid and you're doing, and, and it's paying your bills and you ain't gotta work, then man, give skateboarding 115%. Just stick to skating, you know what I'm saying? And stay out of jail, stay free, stay off of drugs. Uh, I did 32 months at one time, and then I can't got out. 20 days later, I did, uh, 24 months and then I had done 20 months and then I had done a year and then I had done six months which got broken down so I did four months out of that six months. Altogether I say I did about probably a cool nine years <laughs> in jail. Did you think about skating much? Oh yeah, yeah. Freedom is so much better like breathing fresh air and even if fresh air to me is just city buses uh, dirt, like, you know, not in the mountains somewhere. That's fresh air, but still, like, out here is it's so much better. It's better. This is your fresh air? Yeah, it's my fresh air. No matter how much money you ain't got or how much money you got, it's, freedom is the best, man. Nothing, nothing is more better. It's priceless. Fabian's doing good, man. I'm proud of him. He's doing good.
I'm not gonna say he picked up where he left off, but he just like, he's doing better with than when he left off. Like, you know, even when he was doing good, he's doing good. He's doing really good right now, and I'm proud of him. I, I, I like the struggle. I like, you know, it's, it's, it makes you want to go for more, man. I, I mean, you know, this, this acting is making me some money. I see it on the, your Facebook, you're working with some good people. I work with uh, a few, man, like uh, Most Def on, uh, on Dexter. There was like some, and- um, You were on Dexter? Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not something that like, you know, that I can say, oh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna get, I'm getting rich right now from it, but it's, I could see the yellow brick road. I'm following it, you know what I mean? And as long as I stay on this road, I'll be okay.